Good morning Fellowship of the Treasure Hunters. This morning I want to talk about something that uh, many people have probably not heard about before. It's ancient history but it's a very fascinating piece of treasure history. It's about the Wash and King John from in the uh, 13th century. The Wash is a, a large estuary on the northwest corner of East Anglia. It's on the east coast of England where Norfolk meets uh, Lincolnshire and both border on the North Sea. This happened in October of 1216 and King John was a very uh, unpopular king and especially with all of the he was especially unpopular with all the earls and the all the all the earls and the lords uh, of different estates across Europe and it was a time when they were at war with France they were broke and many of the uh, barons many of the English barons had banded together against the king and to overthrow and some of, some of the barons wanted uh, the king of France to rule Britain and um, so King John was basically fighting his way across England headed towards a um, safer area, an area where the people were supporting him. Okay, the Wash is a large tidal inlet in Norfolk in the UK. This story begins when John, in the last few years of his reign, he was an unpopular king for many reasons. Uh, basically, John ended up heading to Norfolk and he sent his baggage in his royal carriage across an area called the Wash. And it's basically an estuary, that a tidal estuary where the, the tide comes in. And it's on the coastline of e eastern England that separates the curved coast of East Angelia from Lincolnshire. It's a large bay with three roughly straight sides meeting at right angles, each about 15 miles in length. The eastern coast of the Wash is entirely within Norfolk and extends a little north of Huntington on the north to the mouth of the Great, the great Ouse at King Lynn's on the south. The opposing coast is roughly parallel to the east coast that runs from Gibraltar Point to the mouth of River Welland and this is all within Lincolnshire. Runs from the Gibraltar Point to the mouth of the River Welland all within Lincolnshire. The southern coast runs roughly northwest to southeast connecting these two river mouths and is punctuated by the mouth of a third river, the River Nene. Inland from the Wash the land is flat and low-lying and very marshy. These are the fens of Lincolnshire, Cambridge, and Norfolk. To the east is the North Sea. During certain times of the year, the tides can come in quite high and unexpectedly. Much of the wash itself is very shallow with several large sand banks such as Breast Sand, Bulldog Sand, Roger Sand, and Old South Sand which are exposed at low tide, especially along the south coast. These form hazards, these, these areas form great hazards to uh, navigation along the coast. The Wash has, has quite a history with the Romans, the Vikings, and the Danes, and um, which use these, this area to invade different parts of, of uh, England during different times, earlier times. The name Wash may have been derived from the Old Eng English Wace, meaning mud, slime, or ooze. Um, in other words, it's, it's, it's not a good place to get stuck. John was not a popular king with his barons. He wasn't the first king to have disputes with his barons, but both his father Henry II and his older brother Richard had dealt with baronal rebellion but the situation had come to a head under John. Most of John's failings in his kingship were personal. He was inconsistent, he could be very vindictive if he perceived himself wronged. 
he had also inherited a country that was in debt due to the Crusades, his brother's Crusades, uh, and the ransom that had to be paid for Richard's release when he was captured on his way home. So if you remember that ties back to the story of Robin Hood and the Crusades and and um, it didn't help that John lost most of his Plantinet lands in what is now France so he was also battling with France at this time. This put his barons, some of his barons, in a difficult position of owing homage to the French king for their lands in France. Uh, it did give John more time to focus on England, but John had been forced to seal the Magna Carta in order to keep his kingship with the lords, and Louis, who was, was uh, the French king, was on English soil fighting for kingship because some of the uh, barons had aligned with France and, and wanted uh, Louis to be the king of of England too. In October of 1216 when Lewis was laying siege to Dover Castle without much success John was ravaging his way through Norfolk and Suffolk. The situation had become dire and the only prominent lords left on on uh, John's side were William Marshall who was the Earl of Pembroke and and the Earls of Chester Derby and Warwick. Even John's half-brother William, Earl of Salisbury, who had been very loyal in the past, had gone over to Prince Louis and the rebellious barons. And Louis held London, and so there was, he had very little access to money, and so John, with what little money he had left, and his few resources, he uh, took off to the, bur the, the areas of the earls that supported him and he took what goods and, and wealth and values that he had with him. It was a treacherous route. Um, it seems like they started out in late October and there was heavy fogs would have been out across the wash area. There was a lot of streams that ran into the estuary, and the sand, the sand, the sandy area surrounding the safe path were incredibly treacherous because they, the water moved back and forth under the sand, and, and different areas uh, were boggy. So whatever the reason, the baggage train, this baggage train that held all of King John's um, wealth and the and his the, the crown and and many other things got bogged down in the wash. And he lost all his carts, wagons, baggage, horses together with his money, costly vessels, and everything which he had particular regard for. It's, he, it, according to a witness, it said, it seemed the land opened up in the middle of the water and caused whirlpools which sucked in everything as well as men and horses so that no one escaped to tell the king of the misfortune. And I, I, it goes on to say that John narrowly escaped what happened. And there are those that um, said that there was possibly an offshore earthquake that caused the, the ground to vibrate and the sand to kind of become liquid and kind of turn like quicksand. It's even possible that there was a small tsunami that swept in and that was what was responsible for taking the, the king's um, baggage cart, his, his wagons and his horses. And it wasn't long after that that John, who was not well, uh, got sick and died. So the question remains, what happened to these carts and what was in them? I'm going to read a list of the things that were in these carts or, or, or were talked about in these carts. And it's, it's interesting to note that, that that was 1216, so hundreds of years have passed, and nothing of any real value, nothing substantial has ever been found yet. So, 
did these valuables end up in the bottom of the, the wash and deep down in the sand? Were they washed out to sea? Or was there something else that happened that made the treasure disappear? But here's a list of the things that were supposedly on this baggage train, in this baggage train. 143 cups and 14 goblets, 14 dishes and 8 flagons, 5 pairs of basins, 40 belts, 6 clasps, 16 staffs, 52 rings and 2 pendants. Two, or four shrines, two gold crosses, three gold combs, a gold vessel ornamented with pearls, which was a present from the Pope, two candelabra, two thurbles, and three golden phylacteries. Uh, many of these were studded with precious stones and made of gold. There was the King John's own regalia and coronation robes, uh, the royal regalia of Empress Maud, who was John's grandmother. These were usually held by the Templars and the hospi Hospitallers, but John seemed to have wanted them with him for some reason. Um, a great, a great crown which came from Germany, a tunic of purple, sandals of the same cloth, a belt of embroidery with stones, a pair of shoes with frets of embroidery, a pair of gloves, a dalmac of dark purple, a royal pedillium of purple with morse and brooch of gold, silver cloth for bearing above the king in his coronation, a great scepter of the same, regal, a golden wand with a dove at the top, two swords, the sword of Tristram, and another sword of the same, a golden spur, a cup of gold of eight mark, two ounce weight, and a cross of gold of three marks, seven ounce weight one wand of gold with a cross and a scepter, a red belt with precious stones, another belt of black skin, a red sandals with precious stones cut and set in a chase, another belt of leather padded with red sandal and great stones set in chase, another belt of red leather padded with white leather with great cut stones set in chase, Another belt of black leather with roses and bars of gold without stones. A necklace or collar set in the middle with diamonds surrounded by rubies and emeralds. Nine great necklaces with many precious stones. A crown with precious stones with a cross and seven flowers. A royal tunic, a royal tunic of red samite with embroideries with precious stones in orals a pair of gloves with stones and another pair with flowers of gold, a white tunic branded with embroidery, red samite oraled and marked all over with the cross in embroidery with stones, great diverse and precious brooches, a pair of sandals of Samite with embroidery, two pairs of Samite shoes, and eleven pairs of bases weighing sixty-two marks. And so not only do you have the precious metal, the precious stones, the gold, the silver, uh, you have very significant historical, they have very significant historical meaning to Great Britain and to the kingdoms of, of uh, England, to the kingdom of England. Um, there were probably many things that were not mentioned on this list that belong to 
you know, King John and to his family that were passed down to him. When um, John's son, Henry III, became king, and it's listed the things that he has, none of these things are listed as in his possession, as is uh, common uh, with the kingdom when they, when they list the, the values of the kingdom. And so we know that this, these things were lost. So all this gold, the belts, the crowns, the basins, and the fabled swords are in the sands of the wash to this day. And they haven't shown up anywhere else. They, door knowledge, they haven't been melted down. It's unlikely that they have ever been found because the value of them as a artifact of royal significance, the value is much greater than the actual value of the stones or the gold or the silver would be. With today's technology, I believe, I believe it's entirely possible that the things that disappeared in the wash could be recovered. If they're still there, if they're anywhere in the area, in that general vicinity, there is technology that should be able to find and be able to recover those things. I don't know all the the significance. I don't know the uh, why a greater search has not been made to try to recover these things. Maybe because it was such a troubled time in England and in Britain in that area. Maybe they were embarrassed about their history or maybe it was an unpopular, unpopular, maybe John was such an unpopular king that that uh, there wasn't very much re regret or feelings of sentiment about his losses. But once again with today's technology with the all the tools, the LiDAR, the infrared, the GPR, all the technology that we have, I believe that the treasure of the wash, the mystery of the wash, could be, could be resolved if the powers that be would allow, um, allow it to happen. So anyway, that's a great treasure mystery. Um, uh, one of the greatest treasure mysteries probably of all time. So any of our friends over there in Great Britain who lives in that area that might be a interesting area for research and if I don't know if there's any metal detecting allowed in that area or not I don't know the land status whether you can whether it's privately owned whether it's land owned by the crown but uh, it is a very interesting and historical story Stays right by my side